So we have uh, saved for the end uh, a fantastic session. Um, it is around uh, AI and research and development in a hotly discussed uh, space. Um, you know, I for one don't like the, the hype in this space at all, but do see as extraordinarily here and now uh, a whole bunch of important problems being solved. And we have just an amazing group of panelists here, and we're really lucky to have them. And um, it's going to be moderated by Najat Khan, who uh, right now is in the process of leaving J&J, &J, where she ran the, the strategy and portfolio and operations group and uh, built and ran uh, an absolutely amazing data science team. And so now she'll take a role at Recursion as uh, their head of research and development and build for them a commercial organization and sit on their board. So Najat, you can welcome your panelists up. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. Okay. Um, thank you, Matai, for the introduction. This is the last panel for the day, so the three yawns I've seen so far, we're going to fix that. We're going to fix it. Um, I have a great set of panelists. I'm not going to enter them. They're in your agenda, so please take a look. Uh, but panelists, please, please come on board. Dina Katabi from MIT. Shastri. Krishna, don't be shy. All right, so um, we were at lunch today and we had a really uh, productive conversation on all things AI and data science, of course, with Andy Plum. So as I was at the lunch, I was thinking, it might be good to start with a little bit of an overview of where um, there are opportunities and impact that's happening end to end across the value chain, but then really dig into two areas with the panelists. One is where are they, pro I would say, where are they positive, negative, or in the middle on AI, provocatively? And then the second is there is a movement happening. You have pharma companies, biotech, and then you also have tech bio companies that are AI first. Let's talk through that a little bit. I don't think we've ever had that conversation over the last three, four years that we've done this panel, and there's been quite a prog bit of progress being made. So, and then we'll open, I promise, I'll save half the time for Q&A. So when we look at data science and AI, um, and starting with discovery, there's a lot of talk that's happened around understanding disease biology better. And, you know, a lot of people would argue that the amount that we know is pretty limited and pretty spotty. So how do we increase that with the, with the generation of multimodal data, getting more cheaper, with the advent of all of the real world data that you're connecting the dots to really understand what's driving disease. So that's one piece that we'll talk about. The second, we've all talked about AlphaFold, generative AI, drug discovery, uh, generating new molecules. Are we going after heart targets? Are we going after Me Too targets? Um, are we actually accelerating the pace? Are we improving the probability of success? Then we'll go into development and talk about designing, what I like to say, designing for reality, which is how do we actually enhance our protocol designs? Um, some people will say it's efficiencies and so forth, but 70% of the funds go into clinical development. Really important that we do it the right way. And we leverage um, the right type of endpoints. So I think there was a conversation around digital endpoints in neuroscience or other types of endpoints in different diseases. How are they being incorporated? Are they becoming real? What do the FDA interactions look like? Close it off with clinical trials. We started off with clinical trials. But um, I will say that, you know, at j and I mean, we have an approach where we actually use machine learning across, I would say, about 80 of our trials now. And it's not just the AI, but it's a combination of AI with clinical operations excellence. We are seeing pretty significant impact. And last but certainly not the least, CMC, manufacturing, especially as we go into new modalities and biologics. So there's a lot to cover. Let's get started. I will start with Mike. Mike, can you speak a little bit to, you know, especially ML in the molecular design space, whether it's biologics or small molecule, and are you provocatively positive or negative in this space? And if so, why? Give us examples. Well, given that I bet my career on it, <laughs> I'm slightly positive. That's good to hear. Um, I'm glad you didn't say too positive. Yeah. I think the reality is um, 
we've talked a lot about technology and applying it to biology for a long time. Obviously, there's been um, some rate limiters that have been overcome, and as we've seen across many fields, um, you know, a decade ago, it would have taken about 100 years to train our core model now that we do it in a couple of weeks. Um, so, you know, computational power has accelerated massively. Um, we focus in on the protein space right now, um, largely because the data is there, right? So, you know, the sequencing revolution gave us 180 million amino acid sequences. The protein data bank gave us 200,000 high quality, high resolution structures. That allows us to start to understand interrelationships between sequence and structure. Um, our company was set up to add function to that domain. Um, and unfortunately, there is no functional database. So how do you generate that data? We have to generate a lot of data at scale. So we spend a lot of time in miniaturization. We spend a lot of time in microfluidics, automation, um, to generate data sets that will now start to allow us to understand this you know, triad of sequence to structure to function. And what we're finding routinely is, number one, we're getting better answers than we basically thought we could get. So we're basically pushing the biophysical limits of measurement. Um, it doesn't mean we're hitting biophysical ceilings. We just can't, don't have sensitive measurements any longer. So we're routinely down in the low femtomolar range for binding. Mm -hmm. um, we're able to co-optimize across a range of different parameters all simultaneously. So it's not a sequential processing um, step any longer. So you can sit there and say, I want to understand manufacturability. I want to understand developability. I want to understand immunogenicity. Um, all of those parameters are starting to get better and better with the more data we produce. Um, and so I think we're at the very early days of starting to be able to program proteins. And when I think about, you know, what that means for the world, um, having control over what is an enormous search space. So the average protein being about 200 amino acids long, 20 natural selections, you're talking atoms in the universe cubed, potential possibilities. Um, you know, nature, for all of its majesty, has surveyed one drop of water in all the Earth's oceans of proteins. And if you had tools to survey the oceans, you're going to find some pretty cool stuff. And we're seeing that routinely. And where the frontier is, and Mark talked about this a little bit before, is we're now at a place where we can actually say to the computer, let's de novo design to a very specific location um, in biology. And those technologies, as far as I'm aware, three years ago, that had never been done. We saw our first de novo antibody three years ago. That's now becoming more robust and reproducible. And that's giving us control and precision in a way that we've never had before. So to me, there's a lot of encouraging features that sit there and say, we're going to start to have more and more control. Now, let's not mistake. We're, we, don't, we haven't mastered biology. We're nowhere near mastering biology. But we're making material progress um, on the tools that we have at our disposal. Mike, just one question that's come up. The word de novo design comes up a lot, and everybody defines it differently. So maybe just how are you defining it? And if you can share the example, maybe three years ago, last six months, that you're most excited about. So de novo design in our world is you have a target of interest. You have an epitope of choice. You have no prior knowledge of anything ever binding that target. And you entirely design a computational sequence, you build it, you test it, and you solve it structurally that binds with specificity to the pre-specified location. And those sort of techniques are now present. And again, you know, if, you, if we, we roughly estimate that 50% of the target universe is not accessible by the immune system, if you have control over it, you're able to go after a ton of biology that we've never had tools to go after. And, you know, I think there, you know, this gets into some of the hype versus reality. I think there are a lot of spurious claims around stuff like de novo design that actually discredits the field. Um, and I think we have to be very careful about what we claim we can do versus what we can't do. Um, and we have to have very high scientific standards for everything we, we push into these sort of domains because, unfortunately, um, there is a lot of noise. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Moving a little bit more into the development space, maybe Shastri and then Dina, do you want to talk about what you're seeing there? Yeah, sure. So, so to differentiate between the hype versus reality that you're talking about, uh, if I go back to my previous job, uh, we had built an algorithm that was using 
high resolution patient level data to be able to predict likelihood of cytokine release syndrome with north of 92% accuracy. Uh, when, we, when we put that algorithm results up in ASCO, one of the people in the audience came up in tears and said, my dad was the only patient on a trial who died of CRS, and if this algorithm existed, he would have probably lived. So then we said, all right, how do we run this into all of the 185 CAR-T players that are out in the market so that we can actually use this to screen patients? And that's where you hit the roadblock of reality, where the processes are so convoluted between what does a site do versus what does an investigator do versus what does a feasibility team do versus a clinical operations team do that the adoption stopped at about 20, 25 percent. And there just wasn't an easy way to actually drive through adoption. And that's where it clicked in all of our heads that we got to go de novo build the processes in development that allow you to be able to automate large chunks of what we do. And that's really what we're working through right now, which is how do you take out hundreds and even thousands of hours of manual work through the use of AI and LLMs. So you start with a two-page description and it turns out a 2,000-page protocol document. Uh, you start with a protocol and it spits out 250 forms that you could use to actually go execute your clinical trial. Or you go from last patient, last visit to database lock in a matter of days as opposed to months because you're automating all of the edit checks. And there's a significant amount of white space that you could take out as a result of this. And last time when I was at this conference, uh, Martin McKay and the R&D team got a little upset because I was still at McKinsey and Andy and Matai was there, uh, where, where I showed R&D productivity slides and they didn't like it. So this time the metric that I can talk off because I'm now working with private equity is EBITDA per FTE. So if you look at the EBITDA per FTE measure in our sector, it's one-tenth of what it is in the tech industry. And that really is a measure of the inefficiency that we're working through across the entirety of the pharma value chain. And earlier in one of the panels, we talked about what does this biotech of the future look like where you're essentially outsourcing large amounts of work to specialized vendors, and internally you probably have these really advanced AI agents that are giving you postdocs on steroids, and you're really concentrating the work of people to actually drive the right leads, targets, matching to be able to run these trials in, a, in an extremely successful way. So, so when I look at hype versus reality in my mind, on the discovery side, the AI toolkit is probably that. It's yet another set of tools that allow you to be able to drive more advanced at the intersection of biology, chemistry, and AI. And then on the development side and the commercial side to an extent, it's all about accelerating development and taking out significant chunks of cost and more importantly time that allow you to get these drugs to patients a lot faster in a safer way. Thanks, Jason. Tina? So to me, I, I think that there is a big need for transformational uh, change in the industry, and particularly on the development side, because this is where you guys spend a humongous amount of the cost. And uh, AI can do many uh, small uh, advances that would help you reduce the cost, but it's not going to change the big equation that you... 90% of the drug fail in the development phase, and as a result, means a humongous 90% of that cost does not end up in the right position or the right de delivering value to the actual patient. So, uh, so there are many things, as we said, that we can just improve the 10, 20%, such as like having uh, ChatGPT or the future ChatGPT writing protocols for you that are uh, like structured in a particular way, saving you time. We can also do uh, site selection uh, in an effective way, and that can reduce the cost reasonably well. Uh, we can do uh, uh, streamlining processes uh, that would do things well. But if you really want to attack the problem at its core, like really changing that equation if 90%, 10%, you need something bigger. And you have to ask your ch yourself, how, how did the IT industry end up with chat GPT? I mean, there were like small things before that were 
uh, I'm just gonna like um, try to label whether this is an image of cat or a dog, or try to take a, a tech piece of text and say whether this is a positive review or negative review. I think if the stuff that we are doing now in pharma is along that line, it's very useful, it's helpful, but it's really not the transformational and foundational model. If we want to do the foundational model, an essential thing is data. This is what all computer scientists, all people in AI have realized very early on that unless we have a humongous amount of useful data, data that is clean and humongous amount, reasonably clean, not perfect, but humongous amount of it, it's very hard to do something like chat GPT. The second thing is something called uh, self-supervision because you can't take data and label it and have a humongous amount of labeled data. So you have to figure out how to do self-supervision, how the model can learn from the data itself and see that whatever it, it learned is correct. So if we can solve these two problems in the context of biology, pharma, uh, chemistry, it's going to be hard to make something better than labeling that this is an image of a cat and this is an image of a dog and however, this is a person. Now, to me, there are opportunities, of course, to, to solve these issues and also opportunities to label images of a cat as well. Uh, to solve the, 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 the problem, the fundamental problem of creating a foundational model for chemistry, for biology, for physiology, we, um, we need to collect that data. So I'm, I'm going to talk about one type of data that I think is very helpful and complement other types of data. So one of the things is to be able to look at the progression of the, of the immune system or the, the, our, the manifestation of the immune system and the inflammation as it appears in our physiological signal. Imagine that you can continuously monitor the respiratory signal, the heartbeats, the EEG, and the, 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 the motor symptoms, and also augmented with some continuous form of understanding uh, or getting a blood test from those people, and have some understanding or have some sequencing of them. Then one of the things that is very nice about your physiological signal is that actually it allows us to do what we did with ChatGPT, which is a continuation. It's being able to predict what is next. And that actually is a type of data that does not exist in the vast majority of other data because they are snapshots. So it's, you can do solve problems such as diagnostic but not progression. If you want progression, you want something that is continuous. Yeah. Imagine what happens if we actually do have that continuation of physiological signals from people over time, and we are able to understand, okay, so when I give somebody this type of drug or this uh, therapy, how exactly it's changing their physiology over time, this is actually a, a measure if the response, your immune response indirectly. And sometimes people don't understand how much it is tied to the immune response, but let me give you an example from, uh, a, from Crohn's disease. So we monitored people with Crohn's disease. And you look at people who, who, who we, we give them drugs, Tolera, Humira, all of those drugs. And you see those people, you, you look at their physiology, which is where their respiratory system, their uh, heartbeats, their, their sleep at the level of understanding slow wave, where actually your microglia system is most active during slow waves. And you look at those markers of inflammation. Not only you can use that to predict markers of other markers of inflammation that are quite common, such as CRP, you can use that physiology to predict their CRP, you can use it to predict their, their calprotectin, but also you can actually see that people before they reach the time when they are taking their dose of uh, Stelera, let's say, and they, many people actually, their inflammation or inflammation marker go up. 
So you are now you have this dynamic system. They go up, they take the dose, and they, they, the inflammation goes down. And then you ask yourself, what happens to those people that today I took this dose of uh, Stelera that was prescribed for me four weeks later when my next dose come, maybe I have different level of inflammation because I know I, I'm sick or I took a vaccine or something. Now I take the same dose. If you are monitoring, if you are measuring, if you have that data, you would know that I am more inflamed than and that this, this same dose that worked for me today would not work for four weeks later. So but, Dina, maybe just in the interest of time. Maybe just one important point that you've made, and I, and I think it's important to emphasize, is that a lot of the times people will say development is an acceleration game using AI. It is not. Development, yes, it's an and. Because when you have endpoints like that, and just to make it real, PSA, I mean, we've used that as biomarker for a very, very long period of time, run a lot of trials. We now have, and we're working with the FDA on it, depending on the dynamic change of the PSA, not just high or low, but the dynamic change, and there's like 17 parameters, machine learning algorithm, you can actually predict the go, no go, internal decision of that program and not wait five years, but you could do it at 18 months. Right? And, just to, and another yeah. example, to make it real, and then I'm gonna pass it on, is also the fact that immune system, how are you responding? Digital pathology slides, and I think somebody mentioned this earlier today, great at seeing the the tumor microenvironment, and we now have certain level, what is a threshold above a certain amount that you know the person might respond versus not. I think the crux to it, though, is actually working with FDA and regulators and being able to deploy it within programs, which is what has not happened to date. And I think that's where you will, there's a increasing the probability of success, patient enrichment, versus just the acceleration. Yeah. I'm going to go so to just Chris. Finish that okay, point. one minute. Yes, yeah. So there are, there are two things. One thing is using it as endpoint, and other, another way is to infusing that knowledge back into medicine and pathways. And I think both are very highly yeah. connected together, and you can improve drastically on that front. Um, Jason, question on manufacturing, any part of the value chain. Sure, uh, and we do do a bit, Ginkgo, just so you know who I am, uh, I'm Jason Kelly, I'm the co-founder and CEO of, of Ginkgo Bioworks. Uh, we do do some work in manufacturing, we did a AV manufacturing project with Biogen, we work with Nova Nordisk, we work with Merck on manufacturing, so we do know about that, but um, we also work with, uh, we do natural product drug discovery for Boehringer, we do RNA drug discovery project with Pfizer. Uh, and also, uh, I gave Najat a, a present for her new job, which is a glowing petunia plant <laughs> the, that one of our customers has developed. It's the first GM house plant. It glows in the dark. Okay, it's from a company called LightBio. Uh, and I mention all this because when people come in the pharma industry and say, hey, oh yeah, I've heard about Ginkgo, I have no idea what you do. <laughs> all right, and, 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 the, the, and I bring that up because I want to say why I'm slightly negative uh, on, on AI's uh, potential in, in pharma. And I, and I think it's, it's because um, the industry ha has not thought of the commonalities in the work that you do on the product development side. I think you have seen and made bets on commonalities in manufacturing and in and, and sort of clinical trials and things like that, and even how you sell the drugs. Um, but in, in the development, it's thought of as like every single project is a, is a unique science project. Um, and I think if you look at the tech industry mm -hmm. and you said, well, Hey, uh, Amazon Web Services, you make Netflix, you know, Netflix runs on you, Salesforce runs on you, movies stream, you know, right? Like you support healthcare systems. Would, any, would anyone say, I don't know what you do? You know, no, they would say you, you run the compute for the industry because that industry has done the work of having a lower abstraction layer for one of their core functionalities, which is the running of compute cycles that are relevant to many different software applications. And then they had a company, Amazon, invest billions on billions of dollars in creating that infrastructure. Where's that for us on the product development side in pharmaceuticals and biotech, right? I might say it's like wuxi. It's not really though, right? Like, like, like you know, <laughs> like what we, it's a good example, right? I, I would say the, the closest thing we have are the CROs and they don't do something like you couldn't do yourself, right? Whereas, for example, to give you another example from the tech industry, NVIDIA, 
yeah. you know, one to two trillion dollar mark cap company, semiconductor chip company, they sell you GPUs, don't have a chip fab, right? They use Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing, not because they could make it themselves and, and TSMC makes it instead. Oh no, no, TSMC is the only place that can make their chips. Okay, because they've been investing at ridiculous scale in the process, this, you know, the actual process of manufacturing, and then other companies are totally dependent on them to develop their product. We, we haven't created those technological dependencies in the drug development cycle, in my opinion, in the biopharma industry, and that's part of the reason that EBITDA per FTE is so bad. Everybody is trying to do everything themselves, everybody's building their own tech stack, and that tech stack's fundamentally inefficient. And so for AI, you know, I think the limitation, and you brought this up, is gonna be the data, right? Like these models, everyone's like, oh, I have some data at my you know, large pharma company. Not true, right? Like it's not the right kind of data for training, you know, the models like generates training, right? You need to have data across lots of different designs. You have to keep all the failed data. That's some of the most valuable stuff to train the model with, in fact. So you don't actually have the right data sets. You gotta make them. How are you gonna make them? Oh, with our research team laughable, right? Like, like the, rate, the rate of data that's coming out of those labs per FTE is a joke, right? So it needs to go to things like automation. Oh, I looked into automation. It's a nightmare. We tried it three years ago. It doesn't work. Also true, right? Automation is a nightmare, which is why a company like ours is invested a billion dollars in automation down the seaport and make it our full-time job, right? You know, because it is actually a hard thing, just like data centers are a hard thing in the computer industry and semiconductor manufacturing is a hard thing in the semiconductor industry. You need specialists. And so I, I'm like bullish in the event we actually lean into creating the large data sets and we do see some of that, but I'm, I'm you know, pessimistic that the industry is ready to think about the business model shift because uh, I think that's probably the most yeah, important thing. That's a fair point. So Krishna, question for you, right? Um, most of the companies that are AI native, let's just call it this way, huge amount of investment focus, as you were saying, automation, data that's generated more systematically, not for a single experiment, very different. Um, and then also, I would say the organization usually half data scientists and half scientists, right? Now you go into pharma, and even a pharma that's very progressive in the data science space, J&J, 2% of your population is data scientists. The data, and I agree, a lot of the data that's generated was generated for an experiment specifically, and not, it's not something you'd actually use to build LLMs and other things. So, in your vantage point, what do you see the future being in the next two to five years of the incumbents versus some of the tech bio companies, um, or at least AI forward companies? Um, the, um, the, the, the person who uh, coined the term AI, artificial intelligence, this guy, um, uh, John McCarthy from uh, the 1960s, and um, he has a famous quotation uh, in the computer science world where it's like, uh, the problem with AI is that any time something works, it's no longer considered AI. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I, think that's, I think that's really true, right? Like, um, uh, you know, things like the Netflix, you know, search algorithm, like that was all kind of, you know, AI at one point. Now it's just like, you know, part of Netflix. Google was considered, you know, search. Like these, these things are actually part of um, the artificial intelligence uh, sort of ecosystem. But then as they become products, they kind of get forgotten in the AI world. And then we're on to the next thing. And I think, um, you know, when I look, uh, work, working at Google Ventures, so we see a lot of stuff in the biotech space, uh, but then we see a lot of stuff in the tech space. Uh, in this current era, uh, I, I believe it's the case that we don't yet have a lot of examples uh, of applications of the large language models, generative AI, and all the things that are making us pay a lot of attention to this um, that are hugely valuable uh, products as of yet. Mm -hmm. um, there's products that are out there that have high valuations, um, but they don't yet have large revenue, other than ChatGPT potentially. Um, you know, and, and if you look at kind of the, um, the profit breakdown, something like 80% of the profits you know, in machine learning right now are going to NVIDIA, pretty much, and, and TSMC. Um, and it, it, it's kind of the opposite of what we saw in the cloud mm -hmm. uh, ecosystem, where actually most of the profits uh, you know, stayed um, you know, with the application providers, the people who actually develop. It's like, you know, the Ubers and Airbnbs and Netflixes and all the people who built the stuff on top of the AWSs uh, and others. Uh, that's where all the profits were. Right now, the profits are kind of in the, uh, in the hardware. And, and I think the question that none of us knows, because this is kind of an empiric experiment that we're all running together, is uh, what do people come up with? You know, and is this an example of a situation where, um, you know, there's a huge hype cycle that's happening right now. It's a big bubble. 
And, uh, you know, I could tell one story where this is Bitcoin and, like, it's all going to crash and maybe it'll come back a little bit, but, you know, we haven't changed the global economy around it yet. Um, that's, that's not what I think. I think, um, you know, I think it is kind of a uh, uh, overhyped, you know, can we underestimate, we overestimate what's hap what'll happen in one year and underestimate what'll happen in 10 years. Um, and I think, I think we are kind of in the process of uh, all discovering what this infrastructure and what this technology can do. Um, but we're all kind of in a messy process. And, you know, we're all in the biotech industry, biopharma industry here, so I think we give ourselves a hard time saying, hey, like, we're behind and we haven't figured out those applications. And I think you're totally right that, you know, the actual, the actual infrastructure isn't uh, systematized. We don't have APIs into things that, uh, that make sense, that make it then hard to scale those things. Uh, even Wuxi, it's like really a bespoke process that each of us does with, you know, CROs every single time. Um, but I, I, think, I think that's the question of our era right now. I think it's actually the most important question that we see as a venture fund is, you know, what are the products? What are the products? How does value accretion happen in this space? I would bet, and we are betting, that it will happen in the tech ecosystem and through a series of trial and error and the messy process of innovation that we've all lived through in different ways. I think that will happen here as well. And when I think of the various companies, um, you know, I think J&J, &J, the work that you guys have done, has been incredible. Um, I think that the work that the biotech ecosystem has done around machine learning meets healthcare um, is very intriguing. There's not as many examples of like, hey, like I can hang my hat on like how ex exciting it is as of yet. Uh, but as GV, I would love to see that. You know, we, we're, I think we're well positioned to make large investments in those companies. Uh, but you could probably count on one hand like the number of companies that stitch it all the way through where, hey, there's a really cool um, you know, platform that's come together and they've chosen the right targets. Mm -hmm. you know? So the billion dollars they're going to spend to develop the thing is actually going to be interesting to somebody uh, as a patient and as a target pro product profile over time. Uh, so, so to me, I'd say you know, short term, I think we're going to hit the edge of this bubble probably quicker than we have in other instances. It's probably going to look pessimistic and people are going to see you know, some sort of crash happen in the space because there aren't really the revenues coming from the applications yet to pick up for the valuations that you see. It'll happen first in tech. Uh, I think it will eventually happen in biotech as, as people are going to ask the question, like, where's the drug? Uh, really great, you know, um, headline, but where's the drug? Uh, but then, you know, I think over the next 10 years, I think it'll go back to that quotation. You know, the things that work uh, will forget that they're called AI, right? <laughs> They'll just be incorporated and you wouldn't start a biotech or do work in pharma without incorporating it. Just like today, nobody starts an email-based, you know, biotech. It's just obvious you would use it, it's just normal, and I think that's the way all these tools will be, and the nature of the tools will become ever more sophisticated in ways that are probably a little hard to imagine, but if you look on the tech side, you're seeing them come up. The next big thing that people are talking about is agentic behavior, you know, so we're using ChatGPT and using Gemini and using Claude, but like, there's another version of that that's all about to come, uh, and I, I'm pretty optimistic those things will be exciting for people, but we'll still have to go through that process of figuring out What's the application? And that's not just a biopharma thing. That's something the whole world is figuring out. And the great thing about that is it means that there's opportunity for anybody who's willing to, you know, to innovate and try stuff in that space. I, I, I actually agree. I mean, just maybe two thoughts, and I'm going to open it up to questions. There's so much in the development space, and the time to value and the ROI is very, very different. And I think the amount of investment right now is all in the discovery space. And I think that, that needs to be more balanced because it's going to take a few years to read out. The second thing, I do agree with you. I think there's going to be a little bit of a restatement because the first version of the drugs that come out, just like 1.0, is never going to be the best, right? Because the platform was still early. That's the lag time that we need to actually go from a target that we invest in, make a program, and then, and then get some proof of concept. But, Nijam, um, may I say one thing? The lead may. times in our industry are going to obscure the effect. Are going to what? Obscure the effect. In Which tech, you can introduce a product immediately. Our process cycles are much longer. Yeah. So I think people are going to underestimate the impact of these technologies massively in life sciences because you can't show the immediate yeah. impact overnight. Exactly. Or even yeah, if but you show, the, it's going to be it's an N of one. Yeah, Is the regulatory mean, yeah. environment needs to significantly upgrade for yes. us to be able to unlock this value because if you, if you draw a comparison to tech, Two clicks in, Amazon knows what product you're starting to buy, and three clicks in, it starts to move the product to a warehouse that's close to you. The, the flip you, side is there, it doesn't matter if they're wrong. Yeah. Right? If they're wrong, it's like, oh, you just back up the page and you figure yeah. it out. And it's like, <laughs> that, that, that's the difference, right? Uh, where, where it's like a huge side? advantage. It's a huge advantage, right? You, you, you can probably start to predict a lot of the patient outcomes 
using some of this data, but then just the ability to be able to do that in a compliant way and to be able to do it without causing harm is still something that we haven't quite figured out. Questions? Stelios. Here you go. Trade then. You can give it right back. It's on. It's on. I was prompted by what you were saying before, and I'll paraphrase a little bit what you said. You essentially say evolution is sort of like the usual process we understand of natural selection, putting pressure. Then every now and then there's a node and a stochastic choice is made. You go down that path. That happens many times. So by the time you end up with something functional, there could be another 10 or 10 million functional, normal-like approaches. We don't know what they are. So we're going to probe all of that. Let me also say... I love data, and I believe in data science. Now, I love the skeptical part. <laughs> We've been trying to put quantitation in our business for 40 years. Combinatorial chemistry. When in the late 80s, early 90s, we all crazy about it. We thought it was going to cover a meaningful part of the universal set of structures, and we're going to probe them. Uh, Ultra-high throughput screening. In 1992, the craze was a chemical called Darwin Molecular, which was using DNA sequencing and directed molecular evolution, probe new structures, solve new problems, and deliver new drugs and put in the clinic in two years. None of the stuff has really made a meaningful difference. My question is, what gives you confidence that now is the time? Now we've got what it takes to really, if I were to put some serious money into your company, that in five years' time we're going to have some phase three data. And the point I will make, one last one, is we keep on talking about getting there faster, efficiencies. I don't care about that. I want to solve a problem I cannot solve conventionally. That's what matters. So, so I, I think the reality of it is, is um, we've moved products in the clinic from concept to clinic in 17 months, right? We've been able to target domains of proteins that have been unsuccessful across all of the industry's efforts. And I'll give you a very tangible example. Everyone that went after the RBD of the spike protein. So for, I'm saying this is, these are tangible examples that I can speak to firsthand right. for my company. Um, you know, all of the antibodies that have been approved either through emergency use authorization or have been prosecuted into the clinic have targeted our receptor binding domain, right? The problem is you put pressure on that domain, viral escape. All the evolutionary biologists post the emergence of Omicron said if you could target the S2 domain, the stem helix peptide, and you could find something that was potent and broadly neutralizing to that domain, it's 99.99% conserved across all sarbacoviruses. There has been no broadly neutralizing antibody that we've seen, you may have seen something else, to that domain. Um, we have an antibody that is through phase one that neutralizes every variant of concern that targets this domain. That's something that was not possible, despite the world's efforts. And we now see data. These are not immunogenic monsters, because you can sit there and say, well, as you search protein space, are you going to find things that are really risky? No, it's actually really well tolerated, no SAEs. And it's doing something we've never been able to do before. So it's giving us tools that weren't at our disposal. I'm not sitting here by any means saying it's going to solve everything. Mm -hmm. But the data is starting to come very, very quickly. And, you know, that, that was our first program into the clinic. The second one was right behind it. We think there will be another four to six in the next 24 months. So we're seeing the productivity start to come, you know, fast and furious. Uh, right. Oh. Yeah. Maybe him and then him. Bill Chin, thank you very much. Um, so so my, my question... Um, deals with a question I was going to ask the FDA commissioner today, okay? And that was Wait, about... Should, Jason will take it. What? <laughs> Jason will take it. <laughs> yeah, Jason will take it. So, Jason, you're the FDA commissioner. Please, no. So, so the question is, Mr. Commissioner, um, we know that AI, ML, et cetera, is, is being invoked as a... Uh, possible solution. We already talked about the limitations to that. 
to all the issues or many of the issues with drug discovery, drug development, and manufacturing. How is the agency looking at AI and ML? So, so one answer is they really don't care because you're just going to have to come up with the product and give me, show, show me the data. But it seems to me that they have to be invested in this. They're very. Najat, yeah. Yeah, I give it to Najat. Okay, so maybe Najat's Najat. most likely to be a future FDA commissioner, so we'll kick it to Oh, her. God. <laughs> no, not into politics. Um, no, uh, so in all seriousness, actually, the FDA um, is very, very engaged, but there's certain parts. When we're talking about clinical development, the design of the protocol, predicting the patient stratification, they're actually asking us, and then the digital, any of the endpoints that we're doing, they're actually asking for entire data definitions, audit trail of where you got the data from, what is the cutoff that you're using, what's your reproducibility, all of that. And one change that I've seen in the last, I would say, 18 months, there's been about 10 different guidances from the FDA on everything from predictive AI algorithms to digital health to real world evidence that's not only been published, but they've also increased the talent pool by hiring the right people that you can actually go back and forth and converse. The second point I will say though, I think at the top of the house, and I'm comfortable saying this in front of Dr. Califf, top of the house is very engaged. Once you get into the divisions, there's high level of variability. And so sometimes when you're sitting across, you're, I'm like, okay, we have the guidance, but you're not even speaking that language, right? So that piece is a bit challenging. The third thing I, do, I will say is that they've actually um, uh, done grants, which actually J&J &J got one of the grants, where they are working with sponsors and academic institutions and the FDA together. We're meeting weekly in order to actually build some of the methods that would allow this to be more useful. So I'll give you an example. Multiple myeloma, we're huge in that space. Progression-free survival in the trial versus in the real world, very different. Everyone's tried to use it, no one's been able to get through because, you know, in the real world, you might not be seeing the doctor the same amount of the time. The intervals are different. So we're actually working with them, and they gave us a grant, to be able to find an approach to correlate the two. Very hard to do. But the FDA is meeting every single week on that. So I, I do want to say that those are the changes that I've not seen before. I would say on the discovery front, the engagement is a little bit different because it's more around, you know, designing molecules and so forth. They're more interested in your IND, is it the right way? One area we're starting to see more engagement is actually using generative AI to create the IND documents, to create the CSRs and so forth, because they're starting to do the same. So now what we're trying to do is match it together so that we don't create a process which doesn't fit with, with, with theirs. So the, uh, I had a lot of recent engagement with the, F, uh, the FDA. What is really interesting is that you see just in the last maybe like eight months to a year is the FDA coming to us as opposed, like we used to go to yeah. them and ask them a question, now they come to us, oh, why don't you like apply for this, like we want to talk to you about this, apply for this program, we want to move these endpoints to become real endpoints. So they are way more engaged in that sense. But I think there is still a significant problem. They are still trying, despite all of this engagement, they are still trying to think about AI using the traditional way they think about biomarkers mm -hmm. and uh, uh, COAs right. and following the same traditional program. And that is a very problematic for people who do AI because just uh, the speed of the technology and the innovation is much faster and fixing the, the, the infrastructures and the algorithm and not allowing for uh, optimization the same way as we see in medical devices, for example, is going to be difficult and stifle innovation in AI. Okay, two, just two more questions. Um, one, he's been waiting in, in the back. He's been waiting for a very long period of time. Thanks, Sanjad. Uh, Krishna, you, you mentioned this sort of from, from the kid. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not very tall, so if people can see me. Sorry, apologies for that. You, you quoted John McCarthy, and I would like to quote uh, the famous bio, biologist and uh, naturalist uh, Edward Ovalson. He said, we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. This is true for AI as well. We can take this in any direction, like a responsible AI, but I would like to talk about the practicalities of applying that, right? So human beings are scared because we are talking about AI replacing their jobs. 
and we talk about human in the loop and we are good at sabotaging something that is going to replace us, how do we think about that problem? How do we ensure that there's going to be adoption and when we are ready it can be successful because this is a true problem. Can anyone comment on that please? Thank you. Yeah, I would actually love to comment on this if you don't mind, because I think, I think a lot of, uh, a few things, like someone brought up combinatorial chemistry, which was sold as, what do we need chemists, and why, why think about it, right? Like, just throw everything at the wall and see what sticks, right? And, the, and, I, and I think that, and it proved to be a failure, and that's kind of turned people off from this idea of big data in general. It's one of the many litany of uh, reasons people don't believe anything could change in, in pharma. Um, I'll give you a different history. Uh, if you go back to the 50s and 60s, e even into the 70s, and you were a tech company, you had both computer scientists and electrical engineers at that company together, if you were at IBM, if you were making mini computers out here in Cambridge. Because there was no computer science. Uh, it, it wasn't even called computer company. science, thank you. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because in order to write software, you had to be an electrical engineer. Okay? Right. 100%, yeah, you wrote Fortran, right? Like, you, you had to know the hardware to write the software. Okay, so along comes a lot of processes to abstract those two things from each other. You created low-level programming languages, um, you know, assembly languages and operating systems like DOS and programming like Java and all this stuff. And it, it took computer science and made it its own, its own thing. It made a lot more electrical engineers and computer scientists, okay, right? Because what you were really doing was, was democratizing this powerful technology by not requiring everybody to have every damn thing in their head to deploy it. And, and that's where we are today in biotech. You gotta have everything. You gotta understand the biology, but you also gotta know what a PCR is, and you gotta know about this, and no, now you gotta know AI too. Like, it's absurd, right? And, and so we have to, if we do the job of abstracting those things into specialists, trust me, there will be way more jobs for all of us. Right, biotechnology today in comparison to tech and electronics is a niche industry. Not just pharma, ag, industrial, all of biotechnology is niche, niche. Okay, and, and, and so that's because we haven't, we haven't got on a technology curve like those guys did and there's no reason we can't. And, and that's what I think is fundamentally different. Generative AI on the, on the data side is generic. It's gonna to apply to proteins, it's also gonna to apply to designing RNA, it's also gonna apply, it's gonna apply, apply, apply. Same thing when it comes to automation for data generation. It'll work for, you should shut your labs down, right? Like, like walk into Google, it, they do not, they have a bunch of people sitting at computers generating a huge amount of value, that's why EBITDA looks like that, that's what Takeda should look like. People like scientists at computers, designing lab experiments, getting data back in the loop, and you'll have way more of them in the future because you'll make a lot more drugs. Yeah. Jason, can I just say one thing, though? I mean, totally agree. People are scared, though. Why, I mean, why, and, and, I know, but, no, no, no. You know, just but why especially be scared, right? in large companies, they're extremely scared. And one of the reasons why we're not having adoption is because we have incumbent people that work nine to five and they're comfortable with their jobs and you don't want to change the status quo. That is one of the biggest reasons the change hasn't happened. So two things is gonna happen. One is, to your point, we're gonna commoditize a lot of these things, Gen AI, this, that, good. But you need to know how to apply it. Like we said in the 90s, a radiologist is gonna be replaced by a radiologist who knows how to use these solutions. But there's also a second part of it, which is how are you gonna incentivize them to use it in an industry where the margins are still pretty darn high? So, I mean, I think that is the crux. That's where you need leadership at the top to ensure this is not a nice to have. You gotta use it, you gotta upskill yourself. It's not enough to think that the next 10 years of your career is gonna look the same. But I think what Jason wants actually, or what he's arguing for is much more fundamental, that the whole nature of the market and the industry is going to change. And actually yeah. if that happens, that's, it, it's much harder than in tech because then if, if a company really has the ability to make all of these connections between the different pathways and uh, why wouldn't they become the actual pharma and why don't they exclude uh, the current pharma, the there's current too many incumbent. things to do. The, the current pharma already has all the, the distribution channels to doctors, you know, right? Like, like, they, like, tr like the core problem is the, the product development is so difficult. Right, like that, that's what ultimately is the limitation, not people's appetite for new drugs. So the pharma becomes in the, the, the distribution channels. And, and they can have the expertise in the... Which disease. is fine, I mean, I'm not arguing that yeah, yeah, it shouldn't yeah. be. I'm I mean, Stelios was mentioning something like that. They'll need to also like have that. expertise in the disease, but I'm just saying they have a massive advantage due to their already 
you know, quasi-monopoly positions on control of the distribution channel, right? That the, so, so like, they are, they're in a strong spot, is my point. Yeah. Okay, last question. Yeah, We're Nadia. way over, sorry for ruining Yeah, th th yeah. thank you, Nadia. Nicely done, as always. Uh, Klaus Romer, Critical Path Institute. Two things that you said that I think are critical. Number one, solutions that are not adopted are not solutions. But second to that is understanding exactly what the solution is to be applied for. So in other words, what's the question you try to solve? Another word for that is context of use in using FDA parlance, right? So should we not come out of this meeting with an action item to get together and, and work on those context of use statements for the different solutions that address critical unmet needs because otherwise the solutions won't get adopted. What do you think about that? Agree. All right, I'm going to close. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs>